All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Um, so there are plenty of seats up front if people want, who are still walking in, come in, grab a seat. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for a fabulous sort of first opening day for, this, for uh, this summit yesterday. I was really energized by both the conversations we had as a group and the individual conversations, and especially by that walking tour of the theaters uh, and the reception at the Ace Hotel. So I hope you're all in as good a place as I am. Um, so, which is LA, which is California, and so we're thrilled to be here. <laughs> Forgot to do that. Um, so this morning, I'm actually really excited uh, to be introducing this session, which I think, I'll take credit for having planned it this way, uh, I think actually builds perfectly on the common session um, that we had yesterday. Um, this is sort of another framework that it's possible to sort of make that I to we shift that so many people were talking about yesterday. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. I'm just here to introduce uh, the person who's going to be running us through the next little bit of this session, uh, who's one of my new favorite colleagues. I, I didn't know him that long ago, um, but Don Howard was uh, recently appointed as the interim president and CEO of the Irvine Foundation. And when we called up the Irvine Foundation, we're talking about coming to LA, Don and all of his colleagues said, great, great, fabulous, whatever you want, whatever you want, fabulous. And I said, Don, we'd love you to come and, and talk to the conference. And he said, ooh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, and so this is actually a success story I'll tell on myself, because as I said yesterday, I'm only interested in speaking with people who don't want to speak with me. Um, and so we got Don here, so I'm really, really <laughs> proud of myself. Thank you very much. Um, so Don, uh, before he was at the Irvine Foundation, spent about a decade, I think, at the Bridgespan Group, uh, where he developed the Strong Field Framework, which we're going to be talking about this morning, and he worked with a great number of nonprofits and sort of worked with them on strategy um, and a number of other issues, including the Irvine Foundation had a very important hand in shaping their agenda of investing in the arts and youth and democracy here in California. So with all of that said, please join me in welcoming Don Howard from the Irvine Foundation. Good morning, everybody. Let me just make sure this mic is working. We're good. Good morning. I'm Don Howard. As Jamie said, interim CEO. Focus on interim. <laughs> Looking forward to giving the job back when we get our new CEO in place. My day job is executive vice president, overseeing the grant making and the programs of the foundation, including our arts program, led by the wonderful and eminently capable Josephine Ramirez, who you met yesterday. <laughs> It was a combination of Josephine and Jamie that twisted my arm a little bit to get me up here. Um, my hesitance came from my lack of uh, having done work uh, in any significant way in the arts field. Uh, but I do know a bit about field building, having uh, done this work at the Irvine Foundation, now uh, leading the work at the Foundation, and also having brought these ideas to some other uh, grant makers in other areas. So I want to share with you how we think about field building as a precursor then to hearing about the experiences that folks are having on the ground. We have an example from Ajo, Arizona, and the example from Los Angeles. And then we're gonna break into groups at tables to talk about the field as it is today and where the priorities should be for building a field and come back and have a fishbowl conversation to debrief. So that's the general arc, arc of the conversation this morning. Uh, I wanna go ahead and just start with uh, why I thought field building was an interesting topic to talk about. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I've been at the Bridge Band Group for more than a decade. Uh, working primarily with nonprofit leaders, but about 30% of my clients were foundation executives. And I spent a lot of time in boardrooms, on whiteboards, charting out theories of change for foundations uh, to predict out their impact, to try to hold themselves accountable. And came to appreciate over time that the unintended consequence of that often was to treat grantees as vendors or contractors who were plugging into a foundation's theory of change as kind of a, uh, uh, if you will, a puppet in a, in a show that was being produced by the foundation. And it became clear to me that that was not the way to achieve social change. It wasn't predictable, it wasn't reliable, and it wasn't um, authentic uh, to the notion of the social sector, innovation and communities being at the heart of what we do. We at Irvine take a different approach. We believe in field building, where we support the work leaders are doing in communities, to help lift up their ideas, help them coalesce around a set of ideas around a common goal, help them develop the practices to achieve that goal, help to build their leadership, help to build their knowledge base, help to build their ability to advocate for public funding to do their work. And in that way, we hope to create sustained social change. 
So we are the glue. We help coordinate. We play a role as convener. But it's not our answer. It's the answer coming from the field. It's the idea of leaders in the field that we seek to propel. And when I heard about what ArtPlace is trying to accomplish and the notion of creative placemaking as a field, very much excited me and appealed to the really the heart of what we do at the Irvine Foundation. So happy to be here, happy to share just a wee bit about what, how we think about field building as a precursor then to a conversation about the field you're trying to build and creative placemaking. Sound good? Okay. So first, let's start with the definition of the field. What is a field? We define it as a community, a community of leaders. Some of them are individuals, some of them are actors, some of them are organizations that are pursuing a common goal and over time align around a common set of approaches to get that goal accomplished. And that sounds very technical, probably a bit dry, certainly could have been better branded. But fields are where we go for affiliation. They're the place we go to find like-minded individuals who are, are trying to accomplish the same goals we're trying to accomplish. They're places we go for nourishment, looking for ideas and support. They're places we go for alliances, places we go for funding and other resources. Over time, fields evolve to be strong and to sustain change and to create pipelines of new leaders, new actors, new organizations trying to achieve the goal with common approaches. So with that definition in mind, spend a moment, think to yourself, what field are you a member of? Now let's just put forward, you can be a member of multiple fields, undoubtedly all of us are. But think of a field that you consider yourself to be um, aligned with, a group that you associate with, a place you go for nourishment, where you go for affiliation, where you go for resources. I'd love to just have you stand up, identify yourself um, by, uh, maybe I'll just take off a few fields. How many of you here think of yourselves as being in the field of community development? Stand on up. Ah, what have you thought, Jamie? <laughs> awesome. So don't back down. How many consider yourselves to be in the field of economic development? <laughs> I see a good cross-section and overlap there. How many consider yourselves to be in the arts field? <laughs> okay, well that makes my last question even easier. How many of you are in the field of creative placemaking? <laughs> Go field. <laughs> I, I might say, this is the field of creative placemaking at the moment. <laughs> and it's clear you all got the memo from Jamie last night <laughs> about where we're heading. Um, but that's awesome. Um, but I think we would all submit that uh, the field of creative placemaking is still an emerging field. What is, I think it's one of its greatest strengths, and we were talking about this this morning, is it is at the intersection of existing fields. If you thought about starting de novo, starting from scratch to create a field of creative placemaking, would be a much longer and harder slog than being able to pull from the various fields that you're currently members of to on top of that layer this notion of a field of creative placemaking. So I think you have a head start and I think it's powerful that this field comes at the intersection of others. So let's talk about the field of creative placemaking. Working with Jamie and Liz and reflecting on the planning work that was done for ArtPlace, we pulled out this you will, working goal. Undoubtedly, there'll be much time to debate the words and time to think about the nuances. But right now, we're defining the goal of the field as communities restored and animated by placing arts and culture at the center of community development. So let's work with that definition for just a second, parse it down. The outcome that the field seeks is restored and animated communities. The common approach and way of getting there that you embrace is by placing arts and culture at the center of community development. So clearly a good definition for a field and its aspiration. That goal is a long way off, but you are the pioneers who are gonna get there. And I imagine it's kind of hard to think forward to say, you know, we'll come together at some point, there'll be instead of hundreds of us, thousands of us, we'll be having a conference and we'll be sharing the successes and the proof points of the work we've done as a field. The distance from here to there is a bit long. This is, if you will, sort of the point on the horizon that we're pointed toward. Um, but let me share a story to make that a little more achievable, maybe a way to make it a little more um, uh, graspable. A little thought experiment. Um, imagine yourself, if you will, suspend disbelief. Imagine yourself as an educator in New York City in the early 20s, rough and tumble New York. 
You've been compelled by stories and your experience of the importance of education in the very early years of a child's life and how that can help set them up for a better adulthood. You've heard about this newfangled idea of nursery schools that are cropping up around the country. You've decided to bring your educational expertise to bear and you've built three of them in New York City. But the whole notion of nursery schools and early childhood education is entirely new. So you spend a lot of your time defining and communicating what a nursery school is. You don't have any resources to draw upon, so you create your own curriculum. You don't know if it's gonna work. You test it, you try it, and you, you see. But you're pioneering and innovating along the way. There's no place to go for accredited teachers. This doesn't exist yet. So you identify individuals you think are competent, you give them the training you think is appropriate, and you develop them and do your best to train them. There's no public funding for your nursery schools, so you, does this sound familiar? You ask for donations, or you charge tuition or admission um, for uh, your nursery schools. Now fast forward to today. Folks following the news, those of you from New York, know that there's a raging debate not on whether or if to provide universal preschool. The debate is how to pay for it. Now, how did we go from having a completely uh, emerging and inchoate field of early education to this point in time? It was through the development of a strong field. Around that time, in the mid-1920s, uh, a group of educators pursuing nursery schools got together, had their first conference, second conference, um, in D.C. in 1926. They called themselves the National Association for Nursery Education. That was the 20s. In the 30s, they got a hold of some public funding through WPA to fund the growth of nursery schools. In the 40s, they began to share ideas and research through a field-wide journal. In the 60s, they had some proof points like Head Start to point to. In the 80s, they developed a set of guidelines to identify and credential uh, high-quality nursery schools. In the 90s, the ranks of their association swelled to more than 100,000. And today, we have politicians who've embraced the importance of early childhood and are making it happen through public policy. Now, that's a 90-year trajectory. I think Jamie said yesterday the goal is seven. <laughs> <laughs> So the challenge well, may well be finding how to do this more, uh, more quickly, but clearly the 20s are different than uh, 2014, and this does come at the intersection of existing fields to draw upon. So how will we know when we get there? We use something at Irvine that we call uh, the Strong Field Framework. It's probably the worst branding in the world. Nobody really wants to pick that up, but it's a definition of a strong and lasting field. And we put forward that it has five elements. First, a strong shared identity. This is clarity around what we're trying to accomplish and alignment around what we're up to. That's supported by a knowledge base, the kind of R&D you need to support your work, and by a pipeline of leadership, and importantly, grassroots support that's, that uh, is the fuel, if you will, uh, for the movement, for the field. The last two, standards of practice a set of approaches that are proven and adopted and used consistently through the field. Lastly, funding and supportive policy to get it to scale. So we use those five components when we do our work to assess where are we on each of these components and how should we, in the modest role we can play as a foundation here in California, invest to strengthen the components of the fields we work in. And we don't, uh, in our work at least, uh, try to build all five simultaneously. We don't think all five are equal at any given time, and we don't think we know best about where to place those bets, but rather we do a lot of work with the leaders in the fields we work in to understand their priorities and how we can make investments to support their work. We're gonna have a little exercise like that today to elicit from you some ideas around priorities within a couple of these areas. But before we go there, let's hear about how things are today. Let's get a sense of how things are on the ground. You all know your experience. We asked two projects to share theirs. The first from Ajo, Arizona, and the second from here in Los Angeles. Let me invite um, Tracy Taft, Executive Director of the International Sonoran Desert Alliance. They're working to preserve and enrich the environment, culture, and economy of the Sonoran Desert uh, to come up, as well as Chris, Chris Beck, Senior Projects Advisor at the US Department of Agriculture. And they'll share what they're doing in Ajo, Arizona, what they're trying to accomplish, the, uh, the um, progress they're making, and importantly, the barriers they're confronting and where they're getting the resources to do that today, from what parts of what fields, 
and where are the gaps that they need uh, support from. Take it away. Tracy and Chris. Oops. Oh, we're at the very end. <laughs> Sorry about that. You're getting a preview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all right. It helps me. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. So um, where is Ajo, Arizona? Why can't I make this work? There. All right, so we are kind of in the middle of millions of acres of Sonoran Desert that looks like that. So you drive for a couple of hours through this beautiful country and get to our little town. That's what it looks like when you're coming into town. This is our town center. So the the red roof buildings on, on the bottom left of the screen are the Curley School campus. It's a seven and a half acre um, public school, old public school campus. And then there's a wide avenue. And then up in the, the right top is the um, town plaza. And it's also, it's another seven acres. It's actually the whole circle, semicircle of buildings that you see. Um, our, and so we are a tri-national nonprofit. We're located out there, out here in the middle of the desert. We used to be a copper mining town. Actually, we used to be three separate segregated towns, Indian Village, Mexican Town, and the Ajo um, Anglo Town site. Um, our goal is to use the transformative power of the arts to revitalize this entire town center, all 15 acres of it, and the economy, and at the same time, always to be bringing people together across these um, deep and old ethnic and racial divisions. So we began, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a very quick overview of the whole project, and then Chris is gonna talk some about the funding mix, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, results and measures and wishes. So we began here with the Curley School, uh, and we, uh, at, at that time, we didn't have any sense of field. We started around 2001, and the only people we knew to talk to uh, were ArtSpace. And so ArtSpace helped us figure out how to turn this into 30 live-work units. This is a typical apartment, um, about 1,000 square feet, rents for $400. This is how we're getting artists to Ajo. And this is the performance venue. It's an indoor-outdoor venue in the school. So that's what we have to work with there. We, we leveraged the developer fee. We earned a large developer fee by being our own developer on the project, and we purchased our town plaza, which was quickly going downhill. So this is from the back of the plaza looking up at the Curley School. And this is what the buildings look like ringing the plaza. They're arcaded Spanish-style buildings um, built in 1916 to 1940 yeah. and um, not improved since. So this is our current project. So now we're moving back to the back half of the Curley School campus. And we are turning this elementary school courtyard into an international retreat center for artists and creative gatherings. This is, we don't have a finished room to show you yet, and we didn't have a wide angle camera, but this is what the rooms will look out at in the back. These are, again, old school rooms with huge windows. This is our work crew. It's taking longer because we developed an apprenticeship program, a DOL registered apprenticeship program to kind of keep the skills, skill building in Ajo and the money in Ajo. And this is Congressman Grahava visiting the mm. program. Um, similarly, we took the big um, empty space in the center and worked with our local Center for Sustainable Agriculture um, accessed a yeah, USDA grant and developed an internship program for young people to um, plant these gardens. So it's a working farm garden in the center. Chris. So um, I'll just sit, that's okay. Um, I wanted to sort of 
talk a little bit about the funding that, that Tracy's received, which she knows more about these um, than I do. And you can see the list. I won't go through them all. I think we just want to illustrate to all of you that the, the federal and state government can be, should be your partners in building this field. Uh, the philanthropy alone is not going to uh, fund your projects uh, in a sustainable manner. And as, as you can see here, Tracy's done a fabulous job, really above and beyond the call, of securing uh, mostly federal money from uh, numerous federal departments, um, including transportation grants and uh, USDA's uh, business uh, grant programs, NEA, of course, a uh, lot of money from HUD. Uh, this is the type of uh, work it's going to take to build the field is determining what sources of grant and loan funds are out there and and then putting in the hard work to to apply and it, it, as Tracy will tell you it's sometimes painful mm -hmm. and and sometimes once you get the money administering it probably is more sometimes more of a hassle than you'd like um, I had a conversation with someone about that yesterday uh, but I think as we think as we talk about building the, the practice you as social entrepreneurs in the in the arts uh, world are going to benefit by going out and securing these kinds of funds and then it helps the government when the government sees arts organizations applying for and receiving these monies for creative placemaking projects, slowly over time, federal state programs will probably evolve too to start seeing themselves as funding creative placemaking projects. I don't think when Tracy applied for these grants, mostly what, in the last two years? Two three. or three years? It's a fair amount of money in the last three years. But the agencies that are making these grants aren't necessarily looking at AHO as a creative placemaking project. Mm -hmm. But as more of these projects mature, or as this project matures, I am almost certain that, that these agencies are going to start thinking, wow, that was a, a creative economy, <coughs> an art, uh, or a creative placemaking project. Maybe we should be doing more of that because of the impact she and, and, and many of you are having in your community. So that, again, it's part of your role of, of being the emissaries for this, this um, practice. You will, by applying and receiving funds, you will be changing what federal and state agencies uh, are doing and how they're looking at their programs. Is that okay? I think there's one more. So we've, th this last is going on currently um, and is a particularly creative mix, um, I think. When we started, we really didn't know how to mix up the funds, and so we had different sources for different kinds of things, and now um, they're mixing really beautifully. So in a rural community, you kind of have to be involved in everything. It's not that we're megalomanic, it's that if we don't do it, nobody will. But, so. I, but I think it's important that even though this is a rural project, this is a model for urban projects as well. I mean, this isn't, the, we all have to be doing, look, doing this and looking for these sources of funds. Yes, agreed. So, so how do you look at the results and how do you measure vibrancy, that, the word that we've all been kicking around? This is how we measure it. None of this was there when we started. So as for the numbers, um, you know, when we started this work, there were four annual festivals in Ajo. Two of them had moved out of the town plaza. Um, so there were only two in the plaza. Today, this last year, there are 32 events, including six, um, or plus six major festivals, and they're all in the plaza. And I guess maybe the best news is we only sponsor a couple of them. So the town has really stepped forward. More and more events are coming. The Plaza businesses have organized and do a big Under the Arches event. So hopefully this will just um, keep growing. Um, and so that is the, 
you know, social cohesion that's happening. Almost all of the events, uh, really all of them are multicultural, whereas they weren't in the past. Um, we put the Tanatam Nation's art and culture uh, in the front whenever we can because they were sort of the most discriminated against in our town and its history. And then secondly, Mexican art and culture. Um, we have economic results. We have 30 live work artist units with 35 artists, many new to Ajo, many operating microenterprises. We have 12 new businesses in the Ajo Plaza. We have 17 new jobs that have been created in the plaza. And we have 10 apprentices getting on the job training. So just from what you've been looking at, those are the, the numbers results. Our challenges, clearly we have the challenge of completing the renovation work, both uh, on the Curley School campus and in the plaza. The plaza is especially tough. Um, and uh, our other important challenge is attracting more young creative people to Ajo. So we'd, we'd really like some help with that. Um, our wish list, um, well, and it's a great opportunity, a rural community. You can, um, you know, have a very responsible job with next to no preparation for it. So, <laughs> it's true. It's true, and that pitch works. We have some nice, you know, energetic young leaders. Um, our wish list includes, of course, grant capital for facilities renovation. I think we'll always be hungry for that, although the end is in sight. Um, we are uh, really looking for a low interest loan to replace uh, debt that we have at 6.3%. In light of yesterday's pitch of the, what do we have to offer, we have six years of proven payment uh, record to offer and good character. <laughs> and um, we are really intrigued, really Chris had this idea and offered it to us about six months ago that um, we should find partners and co-market. So we have been talking with John from Lanesboro where things shut down in the winter and they kind of shut down in the summer where we are about how we could co-market both products and residencies. And we would really like to work with others of you around this idea of co-marketing. I think that you know, there are so many ways that we could be helping each other economically mm -hmm. and tangibly in the field that we're just kind of not taking the time and energy to do. Um, and then uh, just thanks for this networking opportunity. I think, you know, more things like this or site visits to each other's organizations um, are what uh, really help us with new ideas, new partners, and so forth. Teresa, before you step down, you yeah. mentioned in our call the way you had been able to get uh, knowledge, resources, and ideas from other parts of the country. Oh, yes. In essence, how you did, how you accessed the field through <coughs> sort of informal channels or folks mm -hmm. who were in other fields. Could you share a few thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we were lucky to become uh, part of Link's initiative and then the Ford Foundation's Supporting Diverse Art Spaces initiative. And what both of, of these groups did for us was connect us to other creative organizations all over the country struggling with things like we were. and. We just learn voraciously from all of them. We have visited one of their sites. Um, I was just in September up in Seattle visiting Wing Luke in order to learn how to do community curating. Angie at Makla, you know, taught us how to, how we had to do things like have um, collateral materials, you know. We didn't know that. We were coming from a community development background. Everything we did had arts at the center but we didn't call ourselves an arts organization. We didn't really come from the arts background. We didn't know art speak. Um, so, awesome. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next, let's get a glimpse of the LA Promise Zone. Dixon Slingerland as Executive Director of Youth Policy Institute. Um, successfully partnered with the City of Los Angeles to secure a Promise Zone designation for Los Angeles. Uh, one of only three cities in the nation to do that, announced by the president earlier this year. Uh, Dixon's joined by Abigail Marquez, Associate Director of Education and Workforce Development in the office of Mayor Garcetti here in Los Angeles, responsible for the construction, development, delivery of policy and strategy to meet the mayor's education and workforce development priorities. Take it away, Dixon. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to Los Angeles. On behalf of the mayor, right? Welcome, Absolutely. Welcome to LA. Um, so I just want to give a little 
I think we literally have only this slide. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I will. So there will be no clicking. <laughs> Uh, so just to give some backdrop on, so the Youth Policy Institute, YPI, um, we work across Los Angeles, 125 program sites in the city. Uh, many of them are school-based sites, so a lot of education-based programming. We run schools, we do after-school programs, we do job training, family centers, youth centers. We've taken this approach of really sort of a broad, broad swath of programs to try to address fundamental issues like poverty, uh, success uh, in, uh, in educational outcomes, uh, sort of those key, those key outcomes that I think a lot of us care greatly about. And, and for many years now have had a place-based approach to our work, which is at various names. I think 10 years ago we called it a saturation strategy and, and it, it evolves over time. But the notion being to take distinct geographies uh, in LA, for us it's three communities in particular, Pacoima, Hollywood, and Pico Union, uh, and really just try to bring in every conceivable resource in a coordinated strategic way uh, to try to transform communities, transform schools, um, and, uh, and again, see and do fundamental things like fight poverty. I mean, that's in the end what it, what it comes down to for us. But obviously there's a lot of components that go into that. So when then Senator Obama, when he was running for president, announced in 2007, uh, if I get elected, I'm gonna do this thing called Promised Neighborhoods in 20 cities around the country, modeled on the Harlem Children's Zone and Jeff Canada's great work, we were really thrilled. And that began a journey for us now, seven years later, uh, of really working closely with and pursuing these opportunities coming out of the White House around place-based approach to fighting poverty. So the first that rolled out was Promised Neighborhoods. Uh, we, were, we got a planning grant in 2010, so four years ago, which then led to a $30 million implementation grant from the U.S. Department of Education about a year ago. Uh, with Promised Neighborhoods, we're targeting 19 schools, two communities in L.A., Pacoima and Hollywood. Um, the Hollywood part of it is at the top of this boundary you're looking at here for the Promise Zone. Uh, and you're down sort of at the bottom left there in downtown um, LA to give you a sense. Uh, and so we've, we've embarked through Promised Neighborhoods on a very ambitious effort um, to working with more than 40 uh, partner agencies that we are sub-granting funds to as part of the Promised Neighborhood to really try to bring together a coalition that's gonna work together um, and, and address these issues. And I just wanna mention that, that arts is a critical piece of this strategy. So arts organizations that are receiving sub-grants through the Promise Neighborhood uh, include Artworks LA, Create Now, Lacer, uh, Actors Gang, and Unusual Suspects are doing theater programs with youth in the Promise Neighborhood. We've also got the Harmony Project and Youth Orchestra uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Yola's tied to the LA Philharmonic, Gustavo Dudamel, and uh, El Sistema. So we've got this great uh, array of groups, including arts and culture organizations, working in the Promise neighborhood um, to try to change outcomes. So this then led, uh, so 2013 into 14 was a really exciting year. Uh, the White House has three signature neighborhood revitalization initiatives. Promise neighborhoods, choice neighborhoods, which is housing. Uh, and burn criminal justice, which is focused on public safety. So in 2013, we were awarded the other two, thus becoming actually the only nonprofit in the country that had all three um, White House signature initiatives, which is, which is really cool. Um, and that then led to this opportunity working with the city, with our, our dynamic mayor, who has been a big champion of these approaches even before he became mayor in July. He represents, uh, as a city council member, represented the top part uh, of the map you're looking at. Um, so we had the chance in November to apply for a promise zone. Uh, back in uh, the State of the Union last year, President Obama announced, uh, I had these first term initiatives that I just mentioned, Promise Neighbors, Choice Neighbors. For the second term, uh, my focus is gonna be promise zones. The notion here that we need to pull all of this together in a cohesive way. We're not just gonna do education, we're not just gonna do housing, we're not just gonna do public safety, we're not just gonna do arts. It all has to be part of one strategy um, uh, for fighting poverty. And so uh, he announced that in the State of the Union last year. Over the course of the year, they rolled out the competition. And, uh, and as Don mentioned, we were just thrilled in January when the president announced at the White House, um, the mayor and I were there, it was really exciting, that there were five the first five promise zones in the country, of which only three are in cities. So it's us, San Antonio, and Philadelphia. Then there's a rural promise zone and a tribal 
uh, promise zone. So we're now just a month or two into this, um, into this very exciting uh, designation as a promise zone. And do you want to talk a little bit about what it, what it means? Sure. Um, so I'll start by saying that I was not in D.C. with Dixon and the mayor. <laughs> um, but we did host a very uh, dynamic viewing party at City Hall because it really is an exciting opportunity um, for us um, as a city to be designated as one of the first in five in the country. Um, we have been told that there'll be 20 um, promise zone uh, designations in the next couple of years. But it is an exciting time. I think it is also because it builds on, um, you know, we have a new mayor, as uh, Dixon mentioned. Mayor Garcetti was sworn in in July of 2013. And for the first couple of months, he did spend a lot of time laying out his foundation. What will be his priority um, for, what will be the priority outcomes and goals for his administration? So he was already setting a tone um, at City Hall um, in terms of really trying to break government silos and, and helping city departments really think more strategically about we, how we would coordinate resources and work more efficiently together to address issues such as poverty, address, you know, create more jobs, create a more sustainable city in Los Angeles. So when this opportunity um, presented itself, I think what, what we did first and foremost is we quickly came together as a city, um, which was really remarkable. Um, we brought in over nine different city departments to help us um, write the narrative. The Promise Zone um, has 90 partners. Um, that includes nonprofit organizations. It includes the business community, philanthropy, um, and of course our, our city departments. What, what does it mean to be a Promise Zone? Um, for us, um, it means, again, it's a 10-year designation that started in January of 2014. Um, it does involve a, a technical assistance team that will de be deployed um, by the federal government to help us, again, uh, continue to think more creatively um, in, um, in how we be, be more efficient in the way that we deliver services to our residents, how we leverage uh, federal and state funding um, to augment services for our residents. And then lastly, if enacted by Congress, which we hope um, it will pass, we'll be able to access business tax credits for businesses that either hire or invest within the zone. So there's a lot of potential, and I think what the mayor says a lot when he talks about the Promise Zone is that, is that this is one model that he wants to replicate in other parts of the city. So if we, he talks a lot about if we can pull this off within the designated Promise Zone, I think that it will show the country, you know, that we can uh, replicate this model in other parts of the city and other parts of the country. And one of the, the key things about the zone, and so just to give you a quick sense here, basically you're going from Hollywood uh, over into uh, Thai Town, Little Armenia, down through Koreatown, and then into sort of Pico Union, Westlake, MacArthur Park, which is a very high um, Central American population. So it's very diverse. It's really kind of a snapshot of LA. It's 165,000 residents that live in the zone. The poverty rate is 35%. Even in Hollywood, the poverty rate is over 30%, which I think a lot of folks outside of LA are, aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got high poverty. We also have high density. This is the densest part of Los Angeles by far. Um, that, that's being targeted. So it's a really interesting area in terms of what, what's going on within the zone. And I think as Abigail mentioned, getting this competitive preference for federal funding streams that are aligned to our strategies really could be the thing that sort of triggers uh, the transformation of this area, whether it's economic development, housing, uh, commerce, uh, transportation, public, public safety. safety. Yep. Yeah. Uh, really across all the federal agencies will have this competitive preference when we compete uh, including USDA doing uh, for work around uh, food, healthy food options and things like that. Um, and I also then want to just bring back a little bit to the strong field framework because this is sort of so critical to doing this kind of work. Um, and I guess actually you have that slide with yeah. the four things, but is that would be, oh, I've got it, but I don't know how to get to it. Yeah. Do you have to change decks? Change to the other deck, please. And while they're doing that, so I'll just start with the shared identity part, and then we can see the other boxes. 
Um, but so the shared identity, I think that's kind of clear. We're, we're trying to transform a specific community. We've all aligned around this common purpose of how do you turn around a neighborhood? How do you uh, reduce poverty um, in a given uh, geography? Uh, and, and the Promise Neighborhood approach is cradle to college and career. So it's everything from uh, when a kid is born to getting through zero to five to getting through K-12 and then going um, to college and career. On the, the standards of practice piece, so we've basically, everything that happens within the Promise Neighborhood that will happen in the zone is research-based practices. So this is about identifying those approaches uh, that have pro been proven successful that we as a collaborative, and again, the Promise Zone has 90 partners, the Promise Neighborhood has 60 partners, that we as a collaborative have determined our best practices for moving the work across a wide um, range of issues. And then it's about the, the technical assistance, not just from the federal government supporting us as we do this work, but how can we support grassroots community groups within the Promise Neighborhood or Promise Zone um, to really fully play their role and live up to their potential in this collaborative. So whether that we can support them in, in identifying funding and going after that funding that they might need to be successful, whether we can give them a sub-grant through Promise Neighborhood to support them, or whether we can provide t technical assistance and professional development around how do we all do this, um, do this work better and access the resources uh, that we need. On the knowledge base piece, this is really critical to the, to the feds and, and to our work. In Promise Neighborhoods, we have 23 indicators, and that's it. Everything we do is about those 23 indicators. Every partner that we bring on needs to have an impact on one of those 23 indicators. And we have a data system called Efforts to Outcomes that really allows us to track those 23 indicators by youth, by individual youth, and by family unit. So we know if we're being successful on those indicators or not. And we know which inputs are working and which inputs are not working. Um, and so you've got to have this, you've got to have that data system that's absolutely critical that you don't in the end know what you're doing. And you've got to have agreed, in this case, these 23 indicators agreed as a collaborative, these are the things we're going to change together in this neighborhood. On the leadership grassroots support, I mentioned that. We have a lot of partners. We have, uh, as, as Abigail said, everyone from grassroots organizations to the Chamber of Commerce, the United Way, the mayor, the county, the superintendent of the school district, all working together, again, around this sort of common strategy. And then the, the funding and policy piece, which um, in the end is sort of the big picture on this, because if we don't get the systems change that comes out of an effort like this, then it just becomes sort of a, this one-off that we did in the Promise Zone, but the rest of the city or the rest of the state doesn't get the benefit from it. We have a, a great group called LA in Sync, led by the Annenberg Foundation, which has pulled together sort of uh, foundations and philanthropy across LA to support these kind of efforts. Uh, obviously, we've got the public sector uh, very directly involved. Um, federal agencies now through the Promise Zone, you know, sort of directly interacting um, with the work. And then lastly, we're working on uh, a piece of legislation in Sacramento that would do for the state government what has happened at the feds with Obama and what has happened locally uh, with our mayor and begin to align across um, state departments. So I think there's a lot of uh, you know, really exciting stuff going on around, around uh, this and, and the strong field uh, framework here for us. And I just had one example that I'll close with. Do you have anything else you want? To just one example I want to close with of a project we're doing that I think is really aligned to today. So the city and YPI through the Promise Zone are partnering with ArtSpace, the Actors Fund, uh, to create a distinct arts district within the Promise Zone. So this would be a, a $50 million uh, affordable housing project for artists which would also include uh, space for nonprofit or arts organizations, studio space, space for creative enterprises, incubators within the same um, uh, piece. Looking now hopefully at a, a site in Hollywood that, within the zone that, um, for this particular project. And so this would be the first of its type in LA but modeled on successful projects that ArtSpace and the Actors Fund have developed across the country. Uh, and research has shown that these projects help artists become more stable, more productive, and earn more from their um, artistic work, as I'm, sure, as I'm sure you know. But they also help neighborhoods become safer, they create new economic opportunities, uh, and they attract complementary development without displacing residents. So this is an example of a project that we can do in the zone, um, that we can help facilitate in the zone with great partners, um, that they can achieve a lot of uh, really cool things in addition to turning around the community, which is, which is fundamentally what we want to do uh, with the Promise Zone.
we have a minute or two before we're going to take the next uh, step in our um, in our session. Would it be possible for the two projects to reflect back one or two things that are the biggest gaps? As you sort of think about those categories that we've laid out as a strong field, and maybe we should just take funding off, funding off the table because it's so frequently <laughs> the biggest gap we all confront in the work we're doing. But as you think about the creative placemaking aspects of the work you're doing, what's most missing for you right now? What are the priorities uh, that you can't quite access yet? Well, I'm not sure this quite responds, but when we started the Plaza project, the economy tanked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was immediately thereafter. And so um, we have uh, stimulated creative businesses to come into the plaza, new businesses, um, whether they're culinary mm -hmm. or artists, um, you know, selling their work or selling other things. Um, and that's all very exciting, but I I'm thinking more and more that the concept it may be off and that what we, we should be thinking, and this is very exciting to me, is that maybe we have one of the largest anywhere business incubators and job training centers mm -hmm. Um, driven by the arts, but fueling the local economy. So the, there are so many questions in how to mm -hmm. think that through, whether that makes sense, if it does, what sorts of changes would be entailed, um, that uh, you know, that's just a concept and an idea that may make what we're doing succeed, we would love. Uh, assistance in figuring that out. So I think that's a field question. It's not so one local. part of that is knowledge you could draw upon to mm -hmm. learn from others. Another Experience, might be yep. someone to help with the research that might be involved to mm -hmm. determine which direction best to go. Correct. Chris, did you have anything to add? For mm, no. Dixon, what's your biggest gap? So I think it's the the challenge of how do you do this work with a, with a large collaborative because you need the collaborative. I mean, to do something like Cradle to Career, you've got to have a lot of folks at the table. We don't claim we can do everything. The city doesn't claim they can do everything. But it's a lot of work, uh, and it requires a lot of support for the partners uh, in the class. So for example, with the Promise Zone, we're going to have this competitive preference for federal funding, which is great. And theoretically, all the nonprofits in the zone that are partners can take advantage of this. But without sort of the technical assistance and support um, in terms of applying for federal grants, you know, the, the folks who haven't done that before, how do they develop the skills and capacity to do that? Um, as a grassroots organization so that they can, you know, sort of fully take part in the zone. As well as how do we share data across 90 different agencies. It's all going into one data system, but how do you do that in a smart, strategic way that's not threatening to folks who have not ever had to share their data before uh, in a collaborative setting? So I think it's all those things around how to make a, a large collaborative function better and provide it with the support that it needs. I think the only thing I would add is um, because the goals of the Promise Zone are really to transform uh, distressed community into communities of opportunity, I think it's for us the challenge continues to be having the shared identity across these other large systems that are integral to the success of the Promise Zone. So the city, you know, the nonprofit community can't do it alone, the city can't do it alone. We need a strong partnership with our county colleagues, our county con counterparts the school district. So, you know, I think we're absolutely making progress in that direction, but that continues to be the challenge is how do we leverage each other's resources so that we really are truly much more impactful in how we address these, um, you know, sort of issues of social impact. I'm really inspired by your two projects, which are awesome, but also I think the illustration, using them to illustrate the notion of how you brought the Strong Field Framework together at the local level, um, but also where there are gaps and how that sort of notion of a field can operate both at a local level and at a field level. Um, so we heard yesterday from the, um, the marketplace conversation, is that the, the, uh, the commons conversation, excuse me, um, the two of the topics that seem to uh, sort of bubble up in the conversation that were uh, missing components or priority components for the field of creative placemaking were the knowledge base and leadership. So what we thought we might do next is uh, sort of adjourn to the tables behind us there are 20 folks in the room who are table leaders who should have on the back of their card a, a number. Hopefully you know who you are. If you could get up and uh, go to the table that has your number, that would be a good first step. And then uh, we're gonna ask everybody else to join those tables. 
And what we're going to do at the tables, just for too much commotion, is we're going to uh, have half the tables discuss the knowledge base around creative placemaking, and half the tables discuss leadership and grassroots support as the topic, and delve into some of uh, you know, what's there today, where are the gaps, what are the priorities. To make this a little bit more fun, we're going to go for 30 minutes, but for the uh, last five, I'll, I'll call time at about 25, we're going to ask you to tweet from your table two priorities for strengthening the component you've been talking about um, to hashtag art place and hashtag field. And those tweets will be running up on the screen here so we can get a sense of what um, ideas are germinating or bubbling up from the table conversation. So half the tables are knowledge base, half the tables are leadership. Feel free to join whichever table uh, you can uh, make a space at. And at 25 minutes, I'll ask for you to do some tweeting. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a good idea. I also was going to turn my table to come grab that. You don't want to be hot. Take your table. Take a break. And if I can get everybody's attention for one minute, tables 1 through 10 are doing leadership, and 11 through 20 are doing the, uh, the, uh, strong, the, I just blanked, what was the other one? And the knowledge base, sorry, 11 through 20 are doing knowledge base. And leadership, sorry, I'm so sorry. 1 through 10 are doing leadership, and 11 through 20 are doing knowledge base.
Hello. OK, great. OK, we've just got about five minutes left. So if from your table, if you could identify one or two ideas or priorities for your area, knowledge or leadership, tweet those to hashtag artplace, hashtag field. So once again, one or two priorities for your table, hashtag artplace, hashtag field. That's right. both very Okay, please take just one more minute if you could. Put those tweets together. Hashtag art place, hashtag fields. Two top priorities, two top ideas from your table. Hashtag art place, hashtag fields. Okay, if you guys could conclude your conversations and come back to the theater seating for just the last portion of the session this morning. Get in those last tweets, come on back. Did that go well?
Okay, if you could wrap up your conversations and come on back to the theater seating, we'll take the next step. Julia, come on up. Oh, <laughs> excellent. We could all come back to the theater seating. We conclude the session. Great. Not particularly. Sit wherever you would like. I'm going to go. Folks who come on back to the theater seating, we're going to get started with the next part of the session. Let me turn it off. One last call for folks to come on back to the theater seating and we'll continue with the rest of the program. We got it. Where's Liz? I know. Exactly. This is excellent. I just want to say, yeah. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. We're going to get started, and I think we're just waiting. Our, uh, Beth Nordland and Teddy Cruz, if you guys could join us up on stage. Beth and Teddy, are you guys around? Hi. All right. And I think, let's see, Beth Nordland, are you in the house somewhere? And there's Teddy. How are you? Great to see you. There you are. All right, so welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to do a quick one, two, three, four, five. Who are we missing? Excellent. 
Excellent. So welcome back. So this is um, slightly off script, but I sort of believe in unusual indicators. So I think one of the best indicators that we may be perhaps becoming a field uh, is that while we were in that session, I received an email that reads, good morning, Jamie. I am the owner of the domains creativeplacemaking.com and creativeplacemaking.org. <laughs> In order to raise capital for new projects, I've decided to sell the domains. So if anyone wants to own the domains for a new field, um, we've got that. So, all right, I'm joined uh, up here on stage by six of our colleagues um, that were part of the conversations out there. Um, the other colleagues will sort of join us um, uh, tomorrow uh, at the town hall and also do some reporting out. But I don't want to do too much talking. I sort of would like to hear from you guys about the conversations you had at the table and the themes that you sort of heard teased out around leadership and around knowledge, sort of what we have, where are we strong, and what do we need. Um, so I think we're roughly half and half between leadership and knowledge. So why don't we start down at the end with Eric, and will you just say two words to introduce yourself and then give us a little flavor of the conversation at your table. Sure, good morning. My name is Eric Takashita. I work with the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is a national company that supports community development, and I do a lot of work around arts and culture and how it can be used to build stronger communities. Uh, I was part of a conversation about knowledge building and this idea of how do we build the, the field, and there's two things I'd share. One is this idea of there's a lot of information and great resources that have accrued at a national level, uh, but how do we start to push that down into the local environments so that local folks on the ground can actually leverage some of that information? One, and two is how do we also start to build learning communities within local environments so that we can learn from one another, right? So that actually within our communities we can build a stronger community and actually learn from one another as we move forward. Uh, the other piece, if I may, Jamie, would say uh, we also talked a little bit about there's a lot of great anecdotal stuff out there, right? So we talked about how in Cleveland there's this great story about sheep and how the sheep view apartments now are even better than the lake view apartments, right? And then there's like, on the other end of the spectrum, there's ETO, which is this incredibly powerful database that they're using on the promise zones, but is super expensive and really hard to implement. And so how do we find this place in between the story about the sheep and ETO that can totally subsume an organization? That's great. Julia, do you want to? Introduce yourself and yes. pick up from there. Thank you. Julia Taylor with the Greater Milwaukee Committee and working on creational trails. And I think I'll echo a little oh, bit of what uh, Eric hold on said. For, uh, can you guys hear her mic? No. no mic? Try again. Okay, can you hear me now? Come on up here. All right. We'll do it the old fashioned okay, way. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Well, I Actually, I want to echo a little bit of what Eric said. Part of what we talked about was the, uh, because it's everything creative placemaking is, it may, it, in some people's minds, it cannot get defined in any way. Somebody said because it's everything to everybody, it's nothing in the end, that we need to come up with a better definition of creative placemaking. Maybe even the terminology to a certain degree is working against us. Um, but the other piece that we talked about then was how would we look at it uh, in terms of the sustainability of a field and in terms of looking at research. And part of the discussion was looking at developing curriculum for students around creative placemaking, uh, particularly within the different disciplines. Uh, you could tell that you're making a difference when you're actually impacting policy. Um, actually, uh, Prima Katari Gupta talked about the fact that in Philly, you're seeing municipal leaders make different decisions around it. Uh, we also talked about uh, the magical moments of change, uh, and I think it was Brian Corrigan that used that, about when you get the moment where people see underused assets in a new way. He talked about projecting the potential of an opera house in a, just a projection of it in the downtown made people believe that it, it could actually happen. So part of the question is, in research, how do you measure this paradigm shift from early adoption into practice? And then how do you uh, measure that connection of place and culture? All right, just moving on down the line. All right, uh, Eric Robertson uh, with Community Lift from Memphis, Tennessee. We are a local community development intermediary. Uh, we are involved uh, in a comprehensive approach that ranges from everything from economic development to creative place making to community organizing. Uh, at our table, which was the conversation was about uh, the knowledge, uh, there was a, a real conversation about the need for um, developing a network uh, and kind of mapping out that network within the field of creative placemaking. Creative place 
understanding who is doing work related to housing, who's doing work related to education, so on and so forth, and uh, having that accessible to um, everyone within the field. Uh, and then one of the great ideas that was suggested just as a kind of a possible immediate thing was a closed Facebook page where we could um, have access to one another and share information uh, as practitioners uh, in the field. Uh, and then the second kind of leading thing uh, that we came out was, uh, was this idea of um, an exchange um, of best practices, but not only just in terms of some website you can go to, but where you may can visit another city um, where um, uh, you can possibly kind of be immersed in that work of people who are doing uh, related work uh, and have been doing it for a longer period of time. Uh, one of the big conversations was around uh, many of the people at our table were new to the work, and so they were reaching out, trying to find others who had been doing the work for several years, and then trying to make contact to possibly go visit or develop some mentor-mentee relationship with them. So uh, those were our two top things, network, uh, and then some exchange mentor-mentee relationship uh, with everyone, and then mapping out the, uh, the field. That's great, and I just, a quick straw poll. I've heard a lot sort of yesterday and today about the need for that sort of how do we connect with other people, the sort of exchange online marketplace networking kind of ideas, but the fact that we need it with a human touch, we need a curator to help make connections. Is that something that sort of folks general, is there sort of general consensus in the room that it would be useful for someone, some entity to be able to say, you know, Bob, you need to meet Shirley. Shirley, do you know about what Dan's doing? Sort of, okay, all right, excellent. All right, Th thank you. All right, Teddy. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. my name is Teddy Cruz. I'm professor of visual arts, uh, director of the Center of Urban Ecologies at UCSD, also part of here researching the border conditions between Tijuana and San Diego. And I'm here because I'm a grantee and working with MATLAB in the new space in San Jose. Uh, let's see how I can uh, translate the intense conversation we had at our table. One thing, obviously, uh, is that I was uh, leading the, or facilitating the table having to do with uh, leadership support. And obviously, one aspect that came up in the beginning is how we need to blur, obviously, these categories. Uh, because the new leaders, I think, in our field are those who might produce new forms of knowledge uh, and facilitate knowledge transfer uh, from institutions to communities or from the communi communities to institutions uh, to rethink the political today. So one first topic in terms of leadership support was exactly that. We need more practices, emerging practices, whose task is to integrate what has been fragmented, uh, a kind of transversal curatorial project that can convene uh, knowledges, resources, and, and policies. Um, uh, this transversality is needed because obviously one particular phenomenon today is this uh, uh, fragmentation of silos and, and the need for producing new types of um, the kind of summoning of these uh, fragmented institutions. The second piece. Here, Teddy, hold on for a yes. Second. Just take oh. this if you would. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, I w we were referring to the fact that some of the most interesting aspects of leadership have happened in Latin America in cities like Medellin uh, or Bogota, where in fact uh, that uh, possibility of producing new platforms that convene and that curate transversally across institutions and communities, producing a new mediating kind of process between the top down and the bottom up is essential for this new leadership. The second uh, point uh, had to do with uh, Engaging what you have been talking a lot, Jamie, about it, is this, we, are, we cannot continue to preach to the choir, as they say, but we need to produce new conversations, in fact, with those who do not listen. And so new leadership today would imply the construction, construction of a new set of strategies to infiltrate ourselves into those sectors who might not consider us and culture as a primary kind of uh, engine for rethinking many issues, not only economy, but citizenship itself and so on. Uh, so that op obviously would open up a variety of topics. What would that language might be? What else strat strategies uh, could, could enable? Uh, the other uh, topic uh, was, uh, obviously leadership, let's redefine it. And, and I think that it is really about taking risks. I know that that sounds awfully rhetorical, but let's begin there. Uh, how do we speak not only of the strengthening the field by just talking about what we do already well, but in fact, how do we expand the field? 
How do we contact many of the other domains that have been peripheral to our practice? Artists as developers, artists as, uh, as policy makers, many other types of uh, uh, roles that can be uh, taken. Uh, in this case, also somebody at the table said, well, yes, while it is about expanding the field, other ways of practicing, it might be that those are simply creative detours that enable us to contact what has been absent from the conversation only to return to the specificity of our practice or our field. So it is, a, in essence, it's about playing this double uh, role of um, um, a, a disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity in a way. Because you know, many times we speak about expanding the field might, might imply that we are getting away from art uh, in the primacy of art, but in, in fact, we are just contacting other methodologies and procedures just to come back to, obviously, to art itself and advance the culture of uh, Finally, sorry, uh, uh, this is the third point, the fourth, new zones of research. Uh, I think that somebody at the table measured leadership with uh, enabling new forms of measurement and evaluation that not everything can be quantified, obviously, in terms of a success, but that foundations and many other entities could also take equal risks in enabling processes, and in so doing, identify new zones, let's say, of opportunity and, and research uh, to, dis to dispel, uh, as somebody in, in a table said, to dispel the myths that have been created around. Uh, and, the, and the final point, uh, where are, I, I took the, the questions that you gave me very yeah. clearly, where are those leaders being shaped today? Uh, and, and it was an interesting question. We, uh, some people mentioned uh, people like Theaster Gates, uh, uh, for example, in uh, uh, producing exemplary modes of practice that begin to do exactly what we said in the beginning, the integration. Uh, of fragmented domains, uh, so, so that he's produced interesting political language uh, uh, that ha has enabled him as an artist to e speak in the economic forums and, and, and issues of development, or Rick Law, obviously, that opened up the idea that an artist can, in fact, be a developer of housing. Uh, so in that sense, a lot of the most interesting leadership today has been founded in practice itself. Some practitioners who have, in fact, taken upon themselves out of being completely pissed off with their own context right. to produce new methodologies and therefore enabling foundations to recognize these other, other sectors. Um, so uh, I think that that is a question and to, final, to finish maybe is that, that the, maybe the future of this, uh, the, 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 how to form new leaders would depend uh, obviously in the formation of new platforms that obviously foundations and institutions can promote. Uh, to really engage, uh, you know, this variety of issues. Uh, what do we mean by public space? Uh, what do we mean by our practice, you know, uh, need to be supported? I love that. Let me ask a quick easy question and a quick difficult question. In terms of the research piece, how many people in the room identify themselves as researchers? So I think that's an area where we as a community need to make some more investments and make sure more of those people are in the room. Um, number two, how many people in this room consider yourselves to be leaders of creative placemaking in this country? It's great to see that many people comfortable J taking that on. Jamie, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, is, uh, because one person in the, in the, in the, in the, at the table mentioned something about the production of new conversations mm -hmm. that can be organized around very pressing issues. So when we think, for example, of public space or placemaking, we tend to, to, to give priority to issues of beautification, and not to really rethink public space as a site of knowledge, for example, mm -hmm. or knowledge production. So as we reorganize the conversation and produce new interfaces across sectors, we are also producing new political language that demystifies uh, what we've perpetuated as right. a, a definition of certain you know, categories. That's great. Thank you. Beth. I'm Beth Nordland, and I'm from Anchorage, Alaska. I run a nonprofit there called the Anchorage Park Foundation, and I'm one of those non-traditional partners uh, in the room um, for creative placemaking. We have an art place grant to uh, create vibrant places in our parks and on our trails in Anchorage. Um, so I'm new to a lot of the language that is in this room, um, but we <clears throat> my organization builds community through our public spaces and our parks. Um, so our table pushed back on um, the idea of a field mm -hmm. when we were talking about knowledge. 
we started um, very strongly saying that um, that our knowledge is right now in in silos, and that um, if we create a new field, we will create a new silo. And so um, we want this to be a movement, more of a movement and less of a field. Um, um, in order for the authentic place making, that the knowledge is um, in the community and there's no formula for creative place making if it's going to be authentic and local and our knowledge comes from the community. Um, we talked a lot about um, being lateral, so not top down and not grassroots, but more lateral, using intermediaries, facilitating, convening, cross-sector collaboration. I think there's. That's, no, I think that's fabulous. And for anyone following along on Twitter, uh, there's someone I think a lot of people in this room know, Anne Gadwa Nicodemus, who's a researcher uh, and who also organized one of the viewing parties, I think, on HowlRound. And she tweeted that she's especially interested in this notion of the benefits, what are the pros and cons of the field framework? And is it possible to build a field without building a silo, to sort of stick with an agricultural metaphor, I guess? Yeah, so, all right. <laughs> Okay. I, I was proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen. Is, uh, is that on? I think so. Okay. Uh, Colleen Sheehy, I'm director of Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, which is right across the Red River from Moorhead, Minnesota, and we really do work uh, across the borders. Uh, we are involved in uh, the museum really... Just go back since I didn't hear the beginning. Just redo your intro. Oh, okay. Uh, Colleen Sheehy, director of Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, which is right across the river from Moorhead, Minnesota. So we're bi-state, uh, bi-urban, bipolar. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're really trying to uh, mobilize the museum as a leader in the community uh, to think about creative placemaking and community engagement uh, and to get out of the building uh, because museums have been so place-based in their buildings and galleries. So we're uh, with the support of Art Place and we also have an NEA uh, Artworks grant. We're supporting three artist-designed uh, garden spaces, in one in Moorhead right now and two in Fargo. Uh, so in our, in our group, I would say maybe three points. One was um, our own leadership. Uh, many of us are working at you know, the frontier and the stretch point for ourselves, which is where a lot of us like to work because otherwise, uh, you know, why do it? It gets kind of boring just to repeat and repeat. Uh, and so how do we uh, really build up our own leadership and our own knowledge base, and this is a great uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, how can we continue to foster these conversations within and outside of our community nationally? We talked about uh, access to leadership, both from the, I don't know, I hate to say top down um, and bottom up, but uh, different forms of leadership. Uh, we. With creative placemaking, we do need to have relationships and have leadership at the level of elected officials. And, and some people talked about the mayor being a, a critical advocate. Uh, and how do we develop their knowledge base in this area? But also within communities, uh, some people talked about working, wanting to work with the community in the neighborhood, but a lack of infrastructure within uh, certain groups of leadership. There weren't community organizations that made it uh, more accessible to, to connect with communities. Uh, we talked about having uh, the stranger come into town. As I don't know if it was you, Jamie, or Rip yesterday talking about how effective it can be uh, for a leader to come from outside our community and meet with the mayor, meet with commissioners, meet with community 
and that can have a, a big impact on catalyzing uh, mo movement. And then uh, we talked about artists as leaders and uh, how we can, many of us are trying to put artists at the forefront of developing projects and Art Place supports that in NEA, but how do we help artists develop that leadership? Uh, it is not something necessarily they're getting in their art school training. Uh, it's a different set of skills. And Pam um, Atchison in Shreveport, Louisiana, talked about how they worked with the um, Arts Council of New Orleans that mobilized a lot of art projects and artists after Katrina. Uh, and they developed a curriculum for artists. So um, that's something that they can share. So link up with Pam. Uh, that. She's standing over there. Stand up, wave your hand. Pam Atchison from Shreveport. Yeah. Great. Excellent, excellent. Um, just, I just want to make one comment because I've heard a little bit of conversation around that sort of outsider perspective and there's certainly positive aspects to it, but I also want to acknowledge that there are potentially some really bad aspects to it as well. And a friend uh, reminded me of an editorial from the New York Times a couple of years ago that Peter Buffett, Warren Buffett's son wrote called The Charitable Industrial Complex mm -hmm. and about the tensions between being a national funder and being a locally informed funder and just the, the need to sometimes marry national perspective perspective with local knowledge. And I think if the two work together, that can be really powerful and it shouldn't be the sort of parachuting in. Um, Boston, both because you're in the front row and because I made a theater guy from a different time zone wake up at 8.30 in the morning. Um, Boston and I were talking last night a little bit about sort of leadership issues and some of the things that are specific to Alaska and some of the things that are specific to the arts field and some of the things that are sort of broadly in the nonprofit field. I just, I don't know if you have any thoughts, hopes, fears, dreams that you want to share inspired by anything here. My dreams? Well, last night they were incredible. No. Um, <laughs> No, I think we were talking about um, the idea that... And I'm sorry, and Boston, Christopher, yeah. Perseverance Theater yeah, in Juneau, Alaska. Boston from Juneau, Alaska at Perseverance Theater. And um, we, we talk a lot in Alaska about, um, with a limited amount of people, um, I mean, some of these things were said up here, re retention of potential leaders. Um, the, the beauty about Alaska is that you can actually get into, and I think you were saying this too, that you can get into a position without, without actually having any knowledge. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it, and, but you, you know, so it's sort of a learn on the job, learn on the go. And it was interesting at the leadership, I was at one of the leadership tables and just thinking about, you know, we were talking about the difference between leadership as organizations but then I'm also most interested in leadership and individuals and youth and professional development. And yesterday when I was looking around this room, I don't see many people in here under 30. Um, and how do we get those people involved and access to this kind of an event so that they can learn um, and get professional development? And um, that's a big thing for Alaska. And as Jamie was pointing out, there's many communities that that have that same that have that same issue, and you were a highlight of that in terms of how do you retain that in a smaller community. When you get to the larger markets, it seems like it opens up a little bit, and then there's actually competition for those leadership positions. Um, but in yeah, so I mean, I, professional development and leadership in terms of individuals moving forward with whatever the cause is or whatever the movement is, and I like that idea. Um, I think that's in, very important, and I'm old now. Um, but I've thought about this since I was in my 20s. How do I get my generation into the theater? That was my big thing when I was 20 years old. Um, but it seems now that it's moving into this same idea. I'm still thinking about those 20-year-olds, but I'm just old. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so just to follow up that earlier question, for the people who raised their hands and felt comfortable self-identifying as a leader, how many of you guys could identify someone in their 20s who wants to work in this field? And do you guys, for the folks with their hands up, how many of you guys have the resources you need that would allow you to mentor, to share knowledge, to sort of encourage that person along? I see a pretty big delta between the folks who could do it and the folks who feel able to do it. So I think that's maybe another area that we need to focus on. Um, Liz, can we grab five more minutes on this? Or do we, okay. So just because we're a little tight on time, I don't wanna say more. I just, does anyone else out there have questions, comments, 
thoughts, things they want to share. Megan, here, take. Um, I'm partnering with uh, Colorado State University, and they have um, built a program called LEAP, and it's um, a way for art students to get more um, experience in uh, the administrative side and the business side of arts. And I think that they're the leaders in this program, so I encourage you to look that up. It's um, just their, they have a LEAP master's program and a LEAP minor program, and then they, um, through that, I'm able to get interns to come and help me, which is amazing, because it's free, free help. <laughs> That's great, and um, I think Danny and I, Danny's here somewhere, we're talking about UC Davis as potentially being a really strong partner in terms of rural creative placemaking leadership development. Um, and on Twitter, uh, colleague Scott Walters from uh, Cradle, the Center for Rural Arts Development, Leadership, and Education, was also talking about the UNC system as well. So I think there's a real interesting connection with universities. So we have a mic back here with Tim. Um, I, was, I was at the uh, silo table, and there was, I think there was just, you know, I want to elaborate a little bit more on some of the resistance to the ideas of field. Um, on the one hand, somebody at our table said, <coughs> you know, this is stuff that all of us, all of us have been doing, but we're trying to apply a new label to it, and and sort of recognizing um, that uh, that some of the dangers of, of trying to apply too strong a term or too too strong a, a notion of field to it, that um, that what can happen at a play a gathering like this that is really good is the inspirational um, that that we get inspired by each other's, and then one sees commonalities, either commonalities of potential. Um, or, or a commonality of situation, um, that there's a real value in the idiosyncratic and the individual and the anecdotal because one of the great, <coughs> what, what we've seen again and again with cities and communities is where a single idea becomes very powerful and it's not, it's not contextualized or it's not modified to respond to the, the, the particulars of a community or a context or an individual and it can be very dangerous. So to be very, very aware of those risks as we're defining fields and, and generalizing, even, even as we want to learn from each other. Great. Yeah, please, Eric. I just wanna, uh, Wait, gra grab the, this mic just okay. in case. All right, just in terms of the idea of field versus movement, I, I, I totally get the point about the fear of silos, so we definitely have to be aware of the broadness of the work. Uh, but you know, when I think of movements, I think of, I think of things that have a lifespan, like movements have lifespans. I think what we're trying to create is something that will be here 10, 15, 20, 25, 40 years from now in thinking about a field. Years. And I think, I think that's part of where we, I hope we're taking this as we think about it, but um, I think we should be sensitive to it but not necessarily shy away from the idea of institutionalizing to some degree the work through field building. I think that, yeah, Julia, please jump in. I, I want to just feel a little bit too about, I think we're getting caught up in trying to describe the act of creative placemaking and we're not talking about why we do it. Mm. And I think when the point we can get to where we can define better why we do it, we're gonna find greater commonalities in what we're trying to do. Uh, the other piece I worry about is the rush in some ways to define the impact of it uh, because, you know, I think Adrian Rich wrote a book called A Wild Patience Has Taken Me This Far. I mean, we've only been at this, like, what, three or four years in terms of art place. So the longer term impact is going to be one of those 25 year overnight success stories. And we need to have enough wild patience to get there. No, I think that's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, clap, clap, clap. Were you grabbing the mic to say something or just no. pass the Oh, okay, fabulous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Eric was gonna jump in uh, with wild agreement. Um, uh, anyway, I had something to say that's totally gone out of my head. I think we have time maybe for one more? One more, okay, great. Leslie Koch is desperate to tear on the notion of field again. In the block with Tim Tompkins. Hey, um, one of the things that's so inspiring about being together is the sort of network, and it seems like in these two different kinds of discussions network came up. But I want to sort of bring back the notion of place and visiting places. I would love to know how many people have a travel budget in their organizations. Right. I was, right. How many people have a travel budget of more than $5,000? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, my travel budget is my Metro card. Um, 
And, and I have found it extraordinarily useful to go to places. So, I mean, even just as an example, I read all those articles about downtown LA, but it's totally different to walk the street. And as you think about kind of the next stages of art place, you know, not, I'm not asking for boondoggles for all of us, but I think the, the knowledge that we can share when we're in each other's places and talking about that could be incredibly profound. Um, and it's something that is just zeroed out of all of our budgets. And so we don't have the chance to do that, but sort of continuing the conversation, this is about place. And so your place is different from my place, but if I'm in your place, we'll have a totally different conversation even than we can have here. So just something to think about. No, I think that's a great point. All right, so I think unfortunately we really do have to wrap up this session. So I'm going to invite Liz up to do the housekeeping that she loves to do so well. Um, and I just, please join me in thanking Don Howard especially. Uh, and really thanking everyone who participated in this morning's session. So thank all of you guys. Um, all right, so we've got our day kicked off now. We've got a full day ahead of us. Um, next up, we're going to do breakouts. Um, there will be a breakout in here, and uh, that is the uh, performance temporary and the art of the ephemeral. Also, if you're watching at home, that's the breakout that's going to be uh, live streamed. So we're going to reset some chairs really quickly for that. Um, as far as the other breakouts, we have artists, leadership, engagement, um, sorry, artists, leadership, engagement, investment. That's in Museum A, which is right next to us. In Museum B, on the other side, is community identity, past, present, and future. And then we have some changes because there was a leak with all of the wonderful flooding that's been happening. So um, if you're planning to go to shepherding permanent change capital projects in the built environment, that session is now in the Hershey Room which is on the same floor in the same area. It's just a different room um, over on the other side. Um, and if you're planning on going to regional placemaking and government, state, county, local, tribal, uh, that session will take place in the Whitney Room, which again is also still in the same area. It's just a different room. So Whitney Room is the regional placemaking and government, and Hershey Room is the shepherding permanent change breakouts. So they're all set up. They're all, all over there. If you look at page 26 of your program, it has the maps on there for you. Um, after the breaks, uh, we're going to have uh, lunch. In the, uh, in the Noe restaurant, which is on the third floor. You can get to the third floor by taking the elevator up or by taking the stairs up. The stairs are right here, sort of where you came up, um, or there's two elevator banks on either side of the building. Noe restaurant is on the far side. There'll be tables both inside and outside, so you can pick your poison. Um, we will have meetup topics set up there, um, and you'll see um, a, a tent card with the name of the meetup topic on there. Um, then uh, you can still tell us if you have a meetup topic, just do it in the next hour um, and we will have it set up for you when you get to lunch. Um, after lunch, uh, we start again at 1.15. Um, like this morning, please try to be back here in this area um, a couple minutes before 1.15 so that when we hit that time, we can be ready to really get going with that. Um, and we've got a plenary then and some more breakouts. Um, and then later this evening, we're going to have a killer party. So um, get ready for that. Drink your coffee, we're staying out, it's gonna be fun. Um, so we'll give you more uh, details on that as we go. Being curated by a 27 year old. So we are, um, we are nurturing the next generation, the under 30 generation. Um, and there will be art happening everywhere. <laughs> So, um, so, all right, so now um, we have a quick break. There's some snacks outside. Um, take a look at the map in the program. The breakouts are between here and the other side of the building. If you have any questions, let me know. <laughs>